We should go do something different. What should we go drink? Something from the devil's head? From the devil's head? Drinking from the devil's head. A distillery. Where we have craft cocktails and not craft beer. Hmm. I'm such a bad actress. <laughs> but we are actually going to the distillery. You're not acting. <laughs> That's not acting. You're just drinking different. <laughs> Welcome to Stout Conversations, where every week we sit down with creative thinkers in the craft beer industry and beyond. Your hosts, Ken and April, live and work in a 24-foot RV, traveling the country in search of great stories around a great beer. This week, we meet with Ryan from Devil's Head for a different type of craft. Craft cocktails, that is. But before we tackle the story behind Devil's Head Distillery in Inglewood, Colorado, we must first learn how to distill. Specializing in gin, vodka, and aquavit, Ryan's passion is bound to become yours. Prohibition? What's that? Yeah, so, so we do everything, or I do everything, 100% on site here from grain to bottle. So starting out with uh, Colorado-grown malted barley as the base for all of the spirits. Um, so I mash those in the mash tun right here. I do 200-gallon batches at a time, um, uh, like I said, with Colorado malted barley as the base. And so I'll cook the grains in here. Uh, transfer it through the heat exchanger right here. Everything I have is set up to do grain in fermentation, grain in uh, distillation, the whole nine yards. Uh, so it's not, it doesn't look like a typical chiller that you would see at another distillery or most breweries, a plate and frame. But, uh, so I crash cool it in that uh, from the mash temperature, which is about 150 degrees, crash cool it to 80 degrees, um, put it in the fermenter here where it ferments out for three or four days. Um, once that's done, I'll transfer half of it into my 100 gallon still here um, and do what's called a stripping run. And so the purpose of a stripping run is to separate the alcohol from the, the grain solids and the yeast trub um, and the water, essentially. So it'll, my fermentation will uh, end at about 10 to 12 percent ABV. Um, when I do a stripping run, I'm not utilizing the columns. I'm just going from the pot here to the condenser. So you're just, just kind of filtering it out. Not filtering, it's not filtering. distillation, it yeah, so to distilling. it is distillation, yeah, okay. so, but it's just very uh, high temperature and quick as possible, so it just pr produces a very rough alcohol that has a whole range of alcohol, uh, different types of alcohol in it, so fermentation will create uh, more alcohol than just ethanol, which is what we drink, and that's the good stuff, um, so when I'm doing a stripping run, I'm not uh, making any cuts uh, in the distillation to, uh, 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 isolate any particular alcohols. I'm just stripping all of the alcohol from everything else, if that makes sense. Right. And at that point, you are you basically are starting with like a high ABV beer, right? Correct. Basically, it's, you're it's mashing very, a big batch yeah. of high ABV beer, right. and then you're going to distill it down to a more concentrated alcohol, exactly. yeah. and a higher proof alcohol. Exactly. Okay. So it'll ferment out to 10 to 12 percent ABV, the stripping runs. Um, yield uh, about, so on a 100, 100 gallon stripping run, I'll get about 15 to 18 gallons of what's called low wines. That's the results of the stripping run. And that's at about uh, 90 proof for 45% oh, wow. ABV. So I'll mash and ferment enough times until I have enough of those low wines accumulated. Again, the low wines is the, the uh, term to describe the results of a stripping run. Right. And so it has nothing to do with wine. It's, it's not, right. not at it's all related just... to wine. That's just the industry terminology. But, okay. Um, so, yeah, so I'll get uh, 15 to 18 gallons at 45% ABV of low wines. So I'll do that uh, mash and ferment enough times to where I have enough low wines to put back in the still um, for a final spirit uh, distillation. So at that point, um, depending on what I'm making, um, will determine how I configure the still. Um, so for example, if I'm making vodka, I'll use all three, cop uh, all three of the copper columns here. Um, in order to achieve 190 degrees proof or higher, which is the, the federal requirement to uh, oh. be classified as a vodka, one of the variables. If I'm doing gin or aquavit, I'll just utilize the first two columns here. I'll bypass this one, and then uh, this is the botanical basket. So for example, if I'm making aquavit, I'll pack this, uh, there's literally a basket inside here that I'll fill with all of the botanicals that I use in my aquavit, or the same for the gin. Um, and the vapor passes through it, picks up the essential oils, and then comes over to the condenser where it turns back into a liquid. So, so when you're making a different spirit, because you make three different spirits here, base, base spirits, yeah. 
Um, what makes, what's the difference between what makes which spirit? Is it your mash bill or is it the proofing or a combination of these things? Or? So the mash bill is the same. So it's the all malt barley as the base for all three of the spirits that I'm currently making. Okay. So, um, and then the low wines, at the, while they're in the low wines tank over here, it could be anything. And you could, I can make a whiskey out of it. I can make a lot of different types of spirits that I don't even currently make utilizing that base that I got from the malted barley. And so what will determine the outcome is, um, again, the configuration of the still um, and if I'm distilling botanicals or not. Okay. So the only difference between the Aquavit and the gin is the botanicals that I put in the botanical basket here. So it's kind of the flavors you, that you inst instill in the spirit? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So and mine is a vapor-infused uh, spirit. So there's three ways of uh, doing a botanical uh, distillation. There's vapor infusion, which is what I do, that produces a more subtle botanical profile. It's not as in your face as something like Tangare, for example. It's not gonna be real heavy on the pine. Um, there's what's called maceration, which is what Tangare does. Um, and that's where they put the botanicals in the pot with the low wines or with the spirit, and then distill it uh, with the botanicals uh, in the pot. And so that will produce a more robust flavor pro profile. And then the third way I am not a big fan of, um, it's called compounding, and that's where you take a, a neutral spirit and then add tinctures, essentially, or essential oils to flavor. So it's not really a distilled spirit at that point, and I'm very much a purist, so that's so kind of cutting like, corners. Um, that sounds a lot like craft beer and where people start adding, like, a Twinkie or, you know, something at the I end where it's, it's, it's like throwing in, like, yeah. flavors at the end after you've made the beer. Yeah. And then you're like, okay, uh, let's make it taste like a lemon drop, so you throw a bag of lemon drop candy in it. or. Yeah. I think that's a little bit more acceptable to me to do that's something like that. Acceptable. Yeah, as, as opposed to like to create a gin from just taking neutral spirit and adding things, adding flavors into it, um, is not the same to me as actually distilling the botanicals. I, f I feel like that's a more uh, uh, I can't think of the term I'm looking for, not appropriate, but uh, more a, a, a purer way of actually making a spirit as opposed to just adding things to flavor, if that makes well, sense. And you're in the craft world, so I think it's like, is it really a, that artistic craft kind of thing, or is it, eh, we made something to taste like this because it, right. it was fun and it was a fun little hobby thing to do. But. Right. And, and this is a, a hobby for me. Um, I really enjoy every aspect of it, and that's why I don't like to cut any corners because I don't enjoy, that would be uh, more of a job for me than a hobby or you know, more of a joy, if that makes sense. So just like with the barrel-aged aqua beet, um, I could expedite the aging process by using oak spirals or oak chips. It would be a lot less expensive than barrels because I use single-use, brand-new uh, barrels, so they're not, they weren't used for bourbon or wine or anything like that prior to uh, coming in here. And so the cost is a lot greater on new barrels, um, and it's a lot more expensive. Any barrel is a lot more expensive than utilizing oak chips or spirals or something like that, and it takes longer in a barrel. So again, um, that's just one of the other ways that uh, I could make my life easier doing it, you know, using those other methods, but uh, for me that would take all of the joy out of it. During the fermentation, uh, there's a number of different types of alcohol produced other than ethanol, the good stuff. And so on a final spirit run, um, that's where you make what's called cuts. If you've ever heard the terms heads, hearts, and tails, um, that's in a, in a final spirit run. So you've got the, the heads, which is the first stuff that comes off the still that has uh, the alcohols with a lower boiling point. And uh, so that's where the artistry comes in, is where you make those, those cuts, uh, the, you know, between the, the heads and the, and the hearts and then the tails. So the hearts are, are gonna be what contains all the good stuff that we wanna um, capture and keep for further processing. Okay. And then uh, uh, the tails are gonna be the last stuff that comes off the still that's gonna have uh, alcohols that have a higher boiling point than ethanol. As the still continues to get hotter throughout the course of the run, that's when we'll get the different distillates coming over. So, for example, on Wednesday when I was making vodka, um, the final distillate that I'm keeping goes into this uh, intermediary storage tank right here. Um, once I'm done with the run, I'll uh, filter vodka. The, one of the other variables about vodka is that it has to be uh, have, has to come in contact with charcoal for filtration, and so there's no. Uh, standardized method or duration or anything like that. Uh, so that's that's one of the areas where you'll get uh, different qualities of vodka, how thorough it's fil uh, filtered. So they all have to be distilled to a minimum of 190 degrees fruit and have contact with charcoal for filtration. 
Um, so is a higher quality vodka usually a more thoroughly filtered? Correct. Okay. Yeah, yes. okay. yeah. So I'll utilize this right here is a pharmaceutical grade charcoal uh, filter made uh, inside the, the, the thin stainless steel tower column thing right here. Right. Uh, it's got a filter in there that's uh, made using activated uh, carbon from coconut husks, charred coconut husk, which is a really good filter medium. Oh, wow. That'll uh, uh, pull out impurities in the vodka, fusel oils, congeners, things that give you headaches and hangovers, off flavors, things like that. So I'll uh, filter it through there for at least an hour, uh, at which point when it's done, it gets transferred over here into the proofing tank, which is where what I made on Wednesday is sitting currently. Um, and the white tank up, the elevated tank up above there is all reverse osmosis filtered water. So that tank, the proofing tank sits on a floor scale, the blue square there. Um, and I have a software program that I plug in, uh, the proof, the weight, the temperature, and then it tells me how much water to add to drop it uh, from that 190 degrees proof down to the bottle, bottle strength, which is 80 degrees proof. And so I'll open up the valve on the water tank there, fill it, uh, fill the tank till the scale says what it's supposed to say, stir it, let it rest for a couple of weeks. Um, and then bottle it. Okay. Uh, and is that roughly the same process for most of the different spirits it you is. make? It is. The only difference um, with the gin and the aquavit, though they don't require uh, charcoal filtration. In fact, if you ran a gin or an aquavit through that, it would strip a lot of those essential oils out that I purposely... Uh, um, That's the botanicals right. you were talking about. And, so, and you want to keep those in there, and if you run it through that filter, you're right. going to lose a lot of your flavor right. profile yeah, that so makes it a gin or yeah, makes exactly. it an aquavit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but other than that, yeah, the process is pretty much the same. Once it's um, rested after proofing, um, then we come in and do a bottling on the bottle filler right there. We've got a six spout bottle filler um, and the hand crank label machine that we apply all the labels by hand, the closures by hand, then the uh, tamper-proof shrink sleeves, and then it gets boxed and set aside and until it's opened up for somebody to There's enjoy. One thing I got to ask about back here though that I noticed when we came in, pop rocks. Pop rocks. What are the pop rocks for? Uh, the electric Kool-Aid cocktail. Yeah. It's pop rocks. Uh, it, it took me back. It's a, I'm it's like, a fun one. A lot of that was a big thing when I was a kid. Yeah, so. I think it's, it's one of our more popular cocktails. And I think a lot of people order it for that very reason because it's kind of a nostalgic thing to have the pop rocks. That's cool. It's one of uh, my bartender's least favorite drinks to make too because getting the pop rocks to stick to the rim without popping is a real challenge. But. Yeah. I, Imagine it's got to be almost impossible because you got to get them wet, right? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. you got to get it sticky but not too wet that it's going to saturate them. And Coming more from a craft brewery kind of background, is I don't know if aquavit, is that how you say it? Yeah, is aquavit, if that's something that other people are very familiar with when they come into distilleries or if that's something that a lot of people be like, what is this when yeah. they come in? Uh, very rarely do we encounter people that are familiar with it. Definitely more so now uh, after being open for four years. Uh, I was the first producer of Aquavit in Colorado and one of the first in the entire U.S. actually. Um, but in the last few years, it's blown up quite a bit. So about six months ago, I was uh, told by a guy that uh, is uh, an expert on Aquavit that there were five, di uh, five distilleries in Colorado alone producing Aquavit and over 100 uh, in the U.S. Now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and what's, so. I, I think a lot of people are familiar with bourbon with and you make vodka and gin here. You don't make bourbon, but you make vodka and gin here, and people are familiar with that in the U.S., but what's, what is Aquavit for people like so, me that are less educated on that sure. idea? It's a good question, and one that we answer many times throughout the night. I'm sure but, it is, yeah. um, And I, I love that. I, mean, I know from tasting it, it's yeah. fantastic, but... <laughs> well, and I, I love the, the fact that we get to engage with almost everybody that walks through the doors. Um, about that topic because again most people aren't familiar with it so invariably when people come in they start looking at the menu and one of the first questions they always have is what is aquavit and uh, I've actually had bartenders over the years that have asked us or asked me to uh, uh, put it in print somewhere or paint it on the wall somewhere really big where people can see it so they don't have to keep repeating themselves and um, for me that's not something that I want to do because I want that opportunity to engage with the customers like I said so um, Anyways, Aquavit, to answer your question, is uh, it's a Scandinavian spirit. It's a botanical spirit, uh, much like gin. Um, like I said uh, earlier, produced uh, using the exact same methods of distillation. Um, it's been around for six or seven hundred years in northern Europe, so Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, uh, but relatively unknown in the U.S. So the, the distinction between Aquavit and gin is that whereas gin is predominantly juniper berry, Aquavit is predominantly caraway seed um, or dill. 
um, when I first opened, the, the, the U.S. law required that it be a, a caraway uh, dominant spirit. Um, with the popularity growing as it has been in, the, in uh, recent years, they've expanded the definition to include uh, dill forward uh, botanical distillations as well under the, the aqua vie classification. So in Northern Europe, uh, regional variations, some will be dill forward, some will be caraway forward. Uh, mine has both of those in it, but it's definitely a caraway dominant aqua vie. So, I know from tasting it, it does not taste like a dill pickle. <laughs> it is not that kind of dill that no. tastes that you get off of it at all. Right. Yeah, so it's predominantly caraway, mine is. Um, there are some out there that will be more dill forward. Not, not so much like a dill pickle where you get that uh, vinegary flavor, but more like if you think of like, uh, like uh, dill seed is actually what it is that I use. So it doesn't have that. It's, it's more of that authentic dill flavor than that pickle flavor. Right, it's probably some of that pickle flavor comes from other things in the right. recipe yeah. for a dill pickle. For sure, <laughs> yeah, other, other herbs and spices that they use in the pickling process. So uh, mine uh, is uh, caraway, anise, fennel, dill, celery, cubeb berry, and orris root. So that's the, the botanical uh, profile for my aqua vie. Uh, We have new conversations every week. Be sure to subscribe to Living a Stout Life so you don't miss out. In part two, Ryan talks about becoming the first distillery in Inglewood since Prohibition. He actually helped change the laws to make this happen. What are some laws currently on the books that you would love to see gone forever? Let us know in the comments below.